members will make a start. So um, welcome everyone to, uh, I think this is the last meeting which I'll be chairing of health scrutiny um, before the end of this uh, council year in May. Um, and I believe the post will then be Councillor Mbang will be taking over from May. So just briefly, uh, during the meeting, all participants will be in control of their own microphone. Please ensure you turn your microphone off um, when you're not speaking and on when you are speaking. All reports published as part of the agenda will be considered read by members of the panel. Published reports will therefore be summarized to allow panel to focus on questions. Item one, apologies for absence. I've received apologies from Councillor Fahi, Councillor St. Matthew Daniel, and Councillor Scott MacDonald. I've received apologies for lateness from Councillor Sarah Merrill. Um, any other apologies to be given? Nope. Um, urgent business, I'm not aware of any. And declarations of interest, do any members wish to make any? Uh, Councillor Backer. Noted. Perfect. All right. Um, minutes of the last meeting, which was in February. Um, can we take those as agreed, as accurate? All right. Then we'll hand straight over to Nick Davies on our first item tonight on the Home First programme. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, um, in terms of summarising the, the um, paper, and I'm pleased uh, I've got colleagues with me because this is a, uh, a joined up and partnership approach that we're taking to this programme in terms of Home First. Um, so I'll let um, Kate and Rachel uh, introduce themselves when they come in. Um, but I wanted to say in, in introduction really that um, the whole philosophy and approach around Home First is working in collaboration across our health and social care system to enable people um, to return home and become as independent as possible following a um, spell in, in hospital or in the acute setting. Um, and as a result of, of that ambition, um, we've worked really hard um, to make sure we collaborate in how we deliver our services. And in the face of some of the financial and operational challenges that we face to really work together to combine resources and to have some joined up governance around the program to make sure that we're giving the best outcomes for our residents in Greenwich. I think there's an element as well within the program which is around a rapid response um, to avoid people having to go into hospital as well and you'll see in the detail of the program uh, and the range of services that are part of the program that that's really uh, something that comes, comes very clearly through. Um, that's all I wanted to say in introduction because I'll hand to um, Rachel to talk about the scope of the programme and Kate um, to come in with the work of the hospice. And we have shared, and thank you for um, allowing us to share some case studies, um, which we can run through um, once uh, Rachel and Kate have had an opportunity to share their feedback and, and summary. And what I should say is I, um, it was remiss of me, but Kate um, shared a case study which I didn't include, so I'd be grateful if um, when we go through the case studies, Kate's able to touch on her case study as well. Thank you. Okay, hi, so I'm Rachel Matheson. I'm the Associate Director for the uh, Community Physical Health Services uh, delivered through Oxleys in Greenwich. Um, and as Nick says, we're all part of delivering the Home First programme, which we've been part of for the last four years. We're in the fourth year now of delivering that. So um, it's really uh, been a huge uh, project, but also something that we're all really proud of um, to take forward. I, I wanted to talk a bit about the scope, um, which is on, it goes from page 12 to 13 in the papers. I know you've all read the papers, but... Um, we have a kind of strap line, as it were, but the ambition of the Home First programme has been for our local residents to receive the highest quality of care in the most independent environment across the continuum of care, and wherever possible, this should be the person's home. That does include care homes as well. We, we want to you know, be able to provide really good care to people in care homes too. Uh, we have uh, had investment over the 
uh, four-year period, incrementally over that period, into some of the services that are listed in, in Table 1. Um, but really with the, aim, the six specific aims of the program that we set at the beginning, you know, four years ago now, so um, we've spent some time delivering these, um, was the delivery of the urgent community response standards. So this is uh, delivered through the JET team, which is an integrated health and social care service uh, run through the, from the Woolwich Centre, um, and the reablement team that provide a two-day uh, response uh, who are based at Memorial Hospital, um, and really uh, continuing to fund and resource those and develop those, those services which are, are performing brilliantly. Um, improved health and social care outcomes so that people can have a high level of care within their home uh, rather than being admitted unnecessarily to hospital. Uh, we've spent a lot of focus on avoiding unnecessary admissions, uh, services like the, the frailty team um, and the end of life services that um, Kate runs through the hospice. Uh, we want people to have a shorter length of stay in hospital so that people can come out and be at home um, and rehab rehabilitate at home. Um, it's really important that we think about people's preferred uh, place of care, but of um, dying as well. Um, and that uh, if people, you know, we're, we, we're able to deliver that choice for people um, in an environment that is of their wishes to, to have a good um, end of life care. I'm sure Kate will talk a bit more about that. Um, and also that our intermediate care and rehab beds reflect the change in the need of our patients so that we're really um, making sure that we have the right beds in the borough um, to meet the needs that we have for our, our patients and residents. So table one in the pack uh, details all the schemes that had some investment. Um, some of the teams are already in place uh, through pilot schemes um, and we've been able to really embed them now in services. So um, the frailty team, for example, is the first one. Um, this is a multidisciplinary team that uh, scopes across um, a geriatrician at QE, a psychiatrist with the older people's team, mental health team, care coordinators, uh, working with GPs to keep uh, patients out of hospital and optimize people's care. That now uh, is running across the whole of Greenwich Borough with really good outcomes uh, to avoid people going into hospital. Um, we've been able to supplement that with some um, funding from the virtual wards and we partner with Age UK as well um, for that particular uh, project. Um, I'm not going to go through them all in, in uh, detail. We have been able to get speech and language therapists, for example, for care homes. Um, if there are any specific questions about them, I'm more than happy to, to discuss. But as Nick said, some of the schemes uh, cross, uh, across health and social care. Um, and uh, Kate, I, want, I know, wanted to talk a bit about the um, end of life provision, which is detailed at the end of the table. Thank you. So, um, my name's Kate Heaps. I'm Chief Executive at Greenwich Bexley Community Hospice. And as Rachel said, we've been uh, working as a partner through Home First for the entire programme. And the work that we've been doing, um, likewise, has focused very much on supporting discharge from hospital, but also um, avoiding admission where that's um, a, not the best option for the uh, person involved. Um, for those that are not uh, familiar with our services, the hospice already has a palliative care team based at the hospital at Queen Elizabeth. And so what we've been able to do through Home First is supplement that team with additional staffing to support discharge particularly. And then linking that with some of the work um, that we do already in the community, um, in particular in our care homes team and in the work that we do to support uh, continuing health care for uh, patients who are approaching the end of life. So that's been... Um, really important in terms of providing extra capacity and linking up services um, more across the system to help um, address the growing demand as well as this need to try and support more people at, to be at home if that's their uh, preferred place of care. We know from kind of national evidence that the majority of people um, if they're asked about their um, preferences at the end of life, would say that they would prefer to die at home. And so for us, that building that capacity um, in the home environment is really important. And the other thing that we know from the evidence is that 
um, approximately a third of people who are in hospital today, nationally, will have died within the next year. And so actually this piece of the jigsaw in terms of end of life care as part of Home First is a really important thing for us to be recognizing that actually many people who are in hospital are not gonna get better necessarily, that we're, we're gonna make them comfortable and hopefully um, support them to spend the time that they have left with their family and familiar surroundings. Finally, the last thing I was going to mention about um, what we've been doing with Home First um, through the end of life care work stream is we've invested in additional social work in our team. Um, and those social workers are not necessarily doing statutory social work that the local authority would be doing, but focusing very much on some of the children and family work that we do, um, complex family work around uh, guardianship, for example, with parents who are facing end of life, as well as dealing with um, housing issues that are significant for many of our patients who need to get home, but actually home isn't necessarily the best uh, space at the moment, or they don't have a home at all. So trying to make sure that they have got appropriate accommodation for the time that they have left, and just the basics, particularly in the cost of living uh, situation that we're in at the moment, where you know, making sure people have adequate heating, can pay the bills if they're gonna have additional equipment in the house um, and the like. So that's been a very important addition to our team. So I'm handing back to Nick Do first, to I think. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> thanks, Kate. Um, so I think the, the rest of the paper covers some of the, the way the governance works in terms of the Home First program and how it's collaborative across all the partners. Um, also about the funding, which we've had a four-year uh, set of funding, and what I think is important to note is that <clears throat> whilst that funding covers uh, a lot of the programme that you see there, it's matched up with funding that we've got through other funding sources. So reablement, for example, is funded through um, some of the Better Care Fund and Council funds. Um, there's some supplement to that that comes through Home First to enable us to do more. That's just one example, but it's, I suppose, to point to the complexity of trying to manage the range of funding resources in a way that makes the most effective use of those for Greenwich residents. And that's where I think we've got further over the journey we've been on over the last number of years to that transparency of where resources are, <coughs> are going and, and how we're sharing some of those resources. The last thing I wanted to point two is the, the case studies, because I think it's to some extent it, we can talk through um, the programs and the processes and the governance, but it's in the case studies of our residents that I suppose the approach comes alive. So we've shared some, um, and thanks uh, to the chair for allowing us to share these on the slides. They can obviously be circulated afterwards. Um, so we've got... Um, a case study uh, around reablement here, and you'll be aware that reablement is something that's a really important service to enable people to go home first. It's free, a free service for up to six weeks um, to enable people to get their independence back. Um, and in this case, um, we've got um, <coughs> Sheila, um, who underwent surgery on a fractured neck of femur at Queen Elizabeth Hospital following a fall. I think really important in reablement is understanding where people were at before that point um, to really try and get people back to as much independence as they can um, uh, in terms of what they were previously doing. Um, it's not always the case that you can maximise that, but um, our reablement service works with people um, to enable them to do rather than be done unto. Um, and so... Um, uh, Initially, Sheila had four visits a day from home care, um, sorry, from reablement, but that was quickly reduced to a visit through the work that they've done and the fact that we had occupational therapy and physiotherapy. And that's really important as well because whilst we as the council have the reablement service, we work really closely with um, Oxley's colleagues to make sure we get the therapeutic input that really can make a difference to people's goals. Um, so, uh, Sheila, uh, testimony here is how happy she was with the support workers um, and how um, 
uh, her, her daughter equally um, was was um, was um, uh, re really positive about the service that was received. So in terms of reablement, what the Home First programme has meant is that we're able to deliver more reablement for more people, um, and our ambition is to increase that further because what we do see is more people coming out of the hospital setting. Um, we supported uh, in Greenwich 10% more supported discharges last year than we did the year before. It was about 160, 170 people. Um, so that shows the level of demand we've got for this sort of service and we need to ensure we've got the capacity to manage that. So that's the reablement case study. I'll move to Pastor Rachel for the, for the subsequent ones yeah, and then there's, Kate. Um, oops. Thanks. Um, there's uh, three more. Um, this one is around the home first pharmacist. So, oh, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, much louder. Thank you. Um, so we were able, uh, through the Home First investment, to uh, recruit a pharmacist. We had piloted this in our frailty team right at the beginning of the uh, four-year Home First programme. It was very successful, and um, as a result of having the pharmacist, uh, we've been able to do some really targeted meds, meds optimization work with patients. So I asked the Home First pharmacist to give me a case study and, and uh, he passed this one over to me. I didn't know anything about co co anticholinergic burden, but I do now. Um, and I thought I'd share it with you because it just um, gave me a real understanding of some of that incredibly detailed work that the clinicians do that makes such a big difference to an individual. Um, you know, this person was on multiple different medications and we know that if people are have polypharmacy that they're more likely to fall they're more likely to feel unwell more likely to feel confused certainly if you have a high anticholinergic burden you will potentially become um, more confused so this was something that the pharmacist was able to review and change in the community without the person going to hospital um, without the person needing to go to their gp plus with the support of the team around them as well so it's just to share some uh, details of that one. Uh, the pharmacist works uh, into the frailty team, which I mentioned earlier is a, a multidisciplinary team. So I put on the slide here, the, the, it's called the Rockwood score scale. It's a nationally, well, internationally understood uh, scale of, around uh, frailty definition. Uh, the team was piloted right at the beginning of the home first approach, just in one primary care network in, in Riverview in Greenwich. And this was really um, focusing on people that are moderately frail, so scoring five or six on this on the scale. But we would work with people that were more frail, um, but the outcomes are much better with moderately frail people. It really optimizes people's um, abilities to stay at home and to, to live a, a more independent life. Um, so the, this particular example is somebody that the, the frailty team worked with uh, who... Um, they picked out lots of different uh, interventions that um, he needed through this multidisciplinary assessment, um, which include podiatry, going to the falls prevention service, having physio and equipment, even the fire brigade coming to do a fire safety visit. Um, if well, Greenwich are provided through um, uh, Charlton Athletic, and we do a lot of referrals from the frailty team to them. And so this uh, supported uh, this person with social isolation too. So I think it's just an example, really, of the complexity of, of people that are living at home and who can have a much better life if we're able to support them uh, with all these services in their own home. They don't need to be in hospital to receive these. Um, oh, oh, wrong one. Hang on. There we go. Um, so this is... There's a video that I've got here that I want to share, um, which is uh, Elizabeth, who is one of the patients that received... Community Care Plus Physiotherapy. So this is a physiotherapist that we funded who works in QE Hospital, pulling patients out who present at ED or people who need to get um, home more quickly from hospital. We talked about reducing length of stay for patients, and this is one of the patients that he saw. So I'm gonna, is it, if it's okay, I'll show the video.
quite sure how I get back to the uh, PowerPoint. There we go. Close that. Okay, so it, it's just a really good example of the home first approach in that the physio you saw there, Ahmed, he had seen Elizabeth on the ward in QE, um, could see that she had some potential, had lots of, uh, you know, a long way to go, was able to meet her on the ward and then go and see her in the community the next day and just see her every day until she was able to get to where she needed to be. Um, and so, yeah, re that's been, this has been a brilliant programme that we've had um, as part of the Home First approach. I'm going to hand over to Kate, who's got a okay, case. So. Yeah, thank you. And we can share this afterwards. But I'm going to talk about a lady called Joanne Wilson. She's 54, and she lived at home with her partner, Richard, and her 13-year-old. And unfortunately, Joanne's twin sister had died five years previously of a condition called uh, interstitial lung disease. Um, and shortly afterwards, her mother had also died of the condition. Whilst her sister was uh, being treated for this, Joanne was diagnosed with it and became dependent on home oxygen. So she was already quite um, sick uh, being cared for or being supported at home uh, for quite a long time. There'd been a conversation about the fact that her condition was, uh, she wasn't going to get better from her condition and a conversation about where she wanted to be cared for uh, to the end of her life. And when we first met her, we'd met her in the hospital at QE um, back in 2021. And she'd said that she wanted to um, die at home if that was possible. Um, and she had, uh, up until that point, been under the care of the Oxley's community COPD team to look after her. So she'd already been receiving those services, but our hospital palliative care team got involved on that admission. Um, following discharge on that time, she was referred to the hospice's community team and to the social worker and um, had multiple episodes where she was still coming in and out because usually with patients such as this, breathlessness is a big problem and can provoke quite significant anxiety. You can imagine that if you wake up in the middle of the night and you're finding it difficult to breathe, you're um, going to really panic. Um, she was readmitted to hospital and actually was then diagnosed with lung cancer as well. And um, our, we, we had supported her throughout this entire time, working alongside Oxley's uh, district nurses and the like. But um, interestingly, I said earlier on that many people would prefer to die at home. For Joanne, it had become too much to be at home, particularly. And, and this is not unusual, particularly where people have children. They, they sometimes feel that actually coming out of the home is a, is a safe space to be on their own, perhaps, for some of the time, and also to create a safe space for their children so that their children don't associate mum dying with the, the home setting. And so she actually changed her mind, and she decided that she wanted to die in the hospice. But what was positive was that we were able to keep her in the hospice in a more f kind of homely environment, a more appropriate environment than a busy hospital ward. And she was admitted to the hospice um, in the August of last year and died in October. I think the feedback that we had from her husband afterwards um, on our voices questionnaire was very positive, um, but constructive about things across the system that could have been better. And I think, for me, one of the benefits of the Home First programme is that where there are issues that are not necessarily about one organisation, we're in a better position to resolve those now because we're talking to each other more regularly and trying to think of ways that we can resolve problems. So, for example, there was an issue about how long they'd had to wait to get her medication when she was being discharged home and, and uh, ha how that had had to be collected by her husband ra late at a later date so that she could get home. So he had had to go back to hospital. So things like that we can try and smooth over by working in partnership. Um, overall, though, I think that the, the, the additionality that the Home First programme has given us in terms of extra resource, if you like, to support better discharge and to support the social work elements um, and that real multidisciplinary work were really positive for Joanne um, and 
um, we were able to support her to die at the hospice with her husband by her side. He stayed over, he was staying over, and um, that was the best uh, worst case scenario, if you like, uh, for her. So thanks for um, <clears throat> uh, allowing us to talk through those case studies. Thought they would be helpful in bringing alive the program and the work. Um, but uh, at that point, really happy to answer any questions that you may have. Councillor Merrill. Thank you. Um, it, it is a question um, for Kate, and actually, Kate, you have just answered it, I think, really, in what you were, so you probably know what I'm going to ask, which is that um, I completely understand the, all the, um, the benefits and the virtue of this programme and Home First, etc. but there are some people who, well, you said it, like they, they don't want their home to be associated with them dying, so they prefer, and also, my father was one, he felt much safer in the hospice, he just was completely frightened at home. So there isn't any change of emphasis because the, the hospice itself is under, is over stretched. Is there this, or is, is there? So I think actually programs like this and programs like Virtual Ward mean that we can do more in the community for people and we can support people for longer at home, even if they ultimately decide that the hospice is a better place for them. So in a sense, what it's doing is it's giving us more inpatient capacity or the same inpatient capacity, but to see more people for a shorter length of stay in a situation such as you've just described. Because there are a lot of people who don't get the opportunity to even think about home sometimes. And um, with a bit of extra support actually can manage quite well at home. But it's about building confidence and them feeling as though if we say, oh, well, there's community services to support you, that when they really need community services, actually something is going to be available to support them and we're able to follow through with that promise. So for me, it's a really important aspect and um, the inpatient unit is not going to go away, but if it, if it avoids us having to have a bigger inpatient unit um, for people who maybe don't need really complex specialist palliative care, then I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Councillor Hartley. Thank you. Thank you all for the presentations and for bringing the case studies, which are really helpful. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Could you help uh, me to just get my head around this and locate it in time and place, by which I mean, so the pandemic accelerated a lot of work, um, but a lot of this work had been happening before the pandemic, I know. Um, is Home First about bringing that together, improving communication, putting more funding in? You know, I'm, I'm boiling things down to a very simple level, I know. Could you, is that, is that, am I right to understand it that way, or is it more than that? Um, I'm happy to answer that. Um, yes, it was around the, just before the pandemic, to be honest, when we started to look at Home First. It was a business case that we'd put together. Um, uh, certainly one of our colleagues in the um, CCG at the time had been instrumental in that. Um, but I think what, what we wanted to do was deliver an ethos. It's, that, it's the idea that you know, we want to think about home as that primary place. So whilst there was some investment, I think we all could see that it was the right thing to do anyway. We would probably be doing it if there wasn't investment. Um, and it is certainly um, now you know, the direction of travel in all of the NHSE guidance. I'd speak from a health point of view. Um, with virtual wards, I see as the next step for Home First. It's all kind of been incrementally building to that. Um, I think it's, it's mentioned in the, the papers, but we really want to do more com comms around it. I think we've been very busy delivering and probably haven't spent enough time talking to the public and to the community about that. So we do have a comms strategy that we're working on now. 
Um, Health Watch have been a really core part of the programme. They've been um, more recently doing discovery interviews with residents so that we can understand uh, people's experience and how we can improve um, the services and pathways. So um, I, I guess it's really about building that ethos now, uh, you know, across the whole system, including the hospital, so that, you know, everybody in the hospital is saying, look, it's actually you're getting deconditioned. We really want you to, let's think about going home. Let's think about the physio. How can we... You know, think about what's the right time for you to go when you optimise to, to leave. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Um, so then the second part then is, can you help me locate it geographically? So I was reading the South East London uh, Joint Forward Plan, the ICS Joint Forward Plan, and Home First is prominent in the Bexley sections, prominent in the Greenwich sections. Lewisham talks about imp starting to go down that road. That was my kind of lay understanding of it. Can I take from that that we're ahead of, uh, you know, not everything's a competition, but I just want to understand, uh, I just want to understand how we are doing compared to the rest of the ICS and then outside of the ICS, you know, where, where do we kind of, where are we located in, uh, I, in progress on this? Great question. Um, I, we, we are working together with Bexley. So Bexley and Greenwich are doing this as a system. So all of the work that we've described is working in a very similar way. I mean, Kate's work is straddles across Bexley and Greenwich. So does... So does ours for Oxleys. A lot of the services we've talked about here are delivered in Bexley as well. So the Home First investment was across both boroughs. The Home First approach is across both boroughs. The common strategy is both. So uh, and I understand that, yeah. but I suppose um, all of the boroughs are doing something similar. Is that, is that true? Or are we further ahead? I just, I'm trying to get my head around uh, how we're doing in terms of progress. My view is that we're this. further ahead. Um, Ian might know, but, um, as with a more of an SEL hat. Yeah, I mean, uh, you're right to say that a version of this is happening in every borough. Um, I think there's slightly different approaches and um, differential uh, funding uh, gone into it. But I think Greenwich and Bexley are, are fairly far ahead. I mean, I sit on three local care partnership boards, Greenwich, Bexley and Bromley. Um, and I think we feel in Greenwich and Bexley we've, we've got a good partnership and it's going further. Okay, thank you. And a uh, final question, if I may, Chair. Um, it's the nature of these things that we hear a lot about things going well. So I just want to ask about things that aren't going so well. Um, so the six um, specific aims that are in the paper, I suppose, let me phrase it this way, of those six aims, what are you most concerned about in terms of you know, where you'd want to be doing better as a system? Well, we just have a think about that. Can I just add on to what Ian was saying about where we are with Home First? Because I think, in a way, it does link to some of this, I think, from an end-of-life perspective, certainly. I think whilst we definitely are mirroring a similar approach across Greenwich and Bexley, and I would argue that from a relationships point of view, the Home First programme in Greenwich and Bexley is much further ahead than in other parts of the system. I think Greenwich, from my perspective, has some particular challenges around end of life. We have the lowest out of hospital death rate in Greenwich for South East London. Out of hospital death rate for Greenwich, uh, for South East London. Um, and um, it's difficult at this stage to truly understand why that might be. Um, partly, I think it's driven by the fact we've got relatively low numbers of care home beds and actually probably not enough care home beds for Greenwich. Um, we have, as a lot of South East London does, a very diverse population, but I think there is a view in some of our communities that you're going to get better care in a hospital than you're going to get anywhere else, and so you better go there. And, of course, proximity to hospital also drives usage of hospitals. So if you look at uh, um, the data at QE around who dies in hospital, the highest rate of deaths in hospital are from the uh, PCN that surround the hospital. Um, so I think that's interesting. But I also think from an end-of-life care perspective, our primary care context is nowhere near where it should be. And 
we've got a lot of work to do around that area. Um, and a kind of, whether that's a confidence or skills gap is not clear at this stage and we are trying to tackle it and getting good support now from from primary care but I think it it is an important factor in this because if you don't have good primary care dying at home is quite difficult actually so it's really important that we get that right and if I could come back in um just to build on what yeah. Kate said, um, I think that <clears throat> referring to the six aims, um, and Kate's covered the preferred place in case of uh, care, care of death, I think there's work to do in all of them. But I think if you're talking about the risk areas, that avoidance of unnecessary admissions, we know um, <clears throat> that at the moment, particularly, the Queen Elizabeth is, is um, under pressure um, in terms of the front door and the four hour target. So we're working again as a collective to try and work across that uh, issue. And, and um, I know LGT colleagues were hoping to be here to, tonight to, to present, but um, <clears throat> the other I think is around reduced length of stay. So, you know, where we're um, discharging people and where um, through a variety of reasons, you know, that discharge might not be as timely as it could be. There's certainly more work to do there. So I think we're certainly not saying We've got everything sorted. Um, there's certainly work to do. And I think one of the risks, um, we've talked about the funding and the additional funding that was available through that four years and is available into this year. We've got uncertainty beyond this year in terms of that additional funding. So I think that is just a risk to, to flag, really. Councillor Bakken. Um, actually, what you just said um, leads on to my question, or it's pretty much the same as my question. Thank you for your presentation. Um, it's great to see um, such great collaborative working going on. Um, yeah, so my question was about, um, I understand that Home First was initiated following a four-year investment programme of 2.5 million, um, and I couldn't help notice that we're on our fourth year at the moment, and I guess a lot of not a lot of, some of the um, projects that you outlined or the schemes in the report are uh, people on fixed term contracts. Um, and as someone who works in the NHS myself, um, I kind of understand that sometimes no matter what you can do, people are, you know, there's some great schemes and um, people aren't kept on, on contracts. So I guess, how are we making sure that um, that we're collecting the right data so the so the peop the decision makers can see that actually this is probably saving money um and is great for our residents um and is there any security over funding so in terms of the amount that we'll get with a new because because that that bid's now coming to an end thank you um just briefly on some of those roles that are kind of being permanently recruited. We did pilot quite a lot of the approaches just to make sure that they were the right thing. I think, you know, we all, you know, have an understanding of what we know will benefit, but things like the speech and language therapist in the care homes, it was a really important um, post. So that was piloted for a year, had a really good outcome, so we're making that permanent. Um, we want, you know, as a, as a group of stakeholders, we've been trying to make sure we we're delivering things in the right way with the right evidence. So. You know, that's partly why some of them are, are temporary, but um, we, ha we have been able to recruit permanently to, to most of them now. I don't know if that answers the question fully. I mean, coming back, uh, come just building on that, um, uh, I think obviously there's a variety of roles across the, the programme. Um, I mean, certainly when it comes to some of the social care roles, we know that part of the challenge is short-term funding, um, but actually, what we also know is that we've got lots of vacancies for permanent staff. So um, our approach uh, tries to be pragmatic and manage the risk and offer where we can, you know, permanent roles and fixed term roles um, where at all possible, notwithstanding the testing of some of the programme areas. <clears throat> and that's all about us building our sustainable workforce. When it comes to the funding beyond this year, we haven't got certainty. Um, you know, that was a business case that um, delivered that four-year programme. We'd hope that on the evidence base that we've got, and to your point, the fact that we can demonstrate um, outcomes um, is, is, 
it, it puts us in a strong position to put a further business case up. What we know is the context is one across uh, the sector and the sectors of, um, of, of financial deficits and challenges. So I think we're also in a mode of looking pragmatically at what we fund and where our priorities are and certainly not looking to fund new initiatives where we know we've got existing initiatives that we can, um, you know, we can, we can prioritise and approve. And so uh, hopefully that helps a little in terms of um, the question. But Kate, you may want to come in. I think um, just another thing to reflect is that, so as as chief exec of an organisation that's invests uh, that's t taken this money, if you like, and invested in a programme. If I thought home first wasn't the right approach for the residents that we serve, regardless of the money, I wouldn't be doing it. And so, for me, in a world where the the future of the funding is uncertain. I think as a system and as individual organisations, if we think it's the right thing to be doing, then we have to find the money somehow. And if that means not doing some other things, then that might also be an uncomfortable conversation. So the conversation that I have with my team is, you know, just because this is the newest thing doesn't mean that's the thing that you stop you know, in a world where you haven't got enough money or enough people to do a job. And so we have to think about what's making the most impact for people across the system. I think our biggest challenge, if I'm honest, sitting here as largely providers that s serve the community services rather than running an acute hospital, is regardless of whether we demonstrate savings, those savings have to be realized and all the time you've got an open hospital ward, you're not making savings because you're filling those beds with somebody else. And so, you know, that's easy for me to say because I work for a charity and I'm not employed by the NHS. But the reality is that closing a hospital ward is a political nightmare, right? And so it's just not going to happen. So we have to work out how we're going to continue to fund important programs like this that make a difference to residents and the, uh, you know, um, the quality of their lives as well as, you know, using appropriate resources in the right places. Thank you. Can I just ask one supplementary? Thank you. That, that answers my question perfectly. Um, my only quick supplementary would be, um, when are we expecting to hear about funding for beyond the four years, just so we can, I guess, keep it on the scrutiny agenda? I mean, the, the investment is on ongoing, so the, it will become business as usual. I, I think at the moment what we're trying to do is establish exactly how that um, is broken down going forward. So the four-year plan was kind of incremental. There was an increase each year across all of the different strands. Um, and then the investment now will become business as usual. So we're, we're kind of polishing the model and hope, hoping now going forward that, that that is how it will work. I think the challenge we have is that we've got an increasing elderly acute complex uh, population in Greenwich. And, and then, so we've, we've had this program now without further investment because we know the demand will, will increase. We're, we're going to struggle to... Um, to manage, so I think that's our concern, isn't it? We've had we've had a you know really good period of being able to develop the model and really build services. I think we will spend a lot of time this year working together as a system and really getting the model working as efficiently as possible. Uh, I did want to mention that we have set up a dashboard as well, which is, there's an example of it in the paper. So we work as a as group of stakeholders to look at the data across the system to make sure what we're doing is the right thing and evidence based. So. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions on the details of the individual s initiatives, but I want to start with um, a couple of more broader questions. So I thank you for the report and specifically for the demonstrate the page 27, your example dashboard. What I was kind of hoping to ask is going beyond this, well, the, inf the stats you've got here, which is looking at how many people you've picked up under the full, how many people have been, but 
can we go beyond to a more structural stats about the impact of this at the structural at the structural NHS level? Can we say, or do we have any quantifiable impacts on the flow of hospital admissions, the health benefits, the cost implications and savings? And actually, do we know how many or estimate how many hospital admissions we've prevented? Or how many days we've saved in hospital beds? It's a very good question. I'd love to have a, a, uh, a way of formulating that easily. Um, this dashboard has taken some time to develop because it's data from lots of different sources. Social Care, Health Watch have put their discovery data in as well. Our um, patient survey data as well. This has been something we've been working on for the last year and we're still developing it. And I, I agree, we would love to be able to start to look at, you know, those kind of tangible outcomes in terms of, of discharge. The, I would like to kind of draw your attention to the Health Watch kind of reports. There's hyperlinks in here, but they do talk about case studies. And I think what we've, what we've realized is it's quite, it is difficult to quantify the number of bed days saved or the, those kind of um, details. We've been able to do it with a frailty pilot where we have proved that um, after people have had care from the frailty team that they'll have reduced number of bed days, that they won't go to A&E as much after, after they've had that. That program is now across the whole borough, so we know that, that, that will, um, we will, will be able to measure that as a program. Um, but being able to measure it as a whole, across the whole borough, is, is, is our challenge. So we've started with the dashboard. Um, we will hope to get there you know, as we're able to progress more with that shared digital data platform. And just to build on that, I think there are individual examples where we can show um, the benefit. So if we take reablement, for example, I think as we've reported through our medium term financial strategy work within the council, we've got um, a, a really clear way of tracking the cost avoidance benefit of a reablement intervention. And we've evidenced that and we can link that back to our ledger. So that's just one example um, <clears throat> that shows over the three year period, somewhere in the region of a seven million pound cost avoidance that we'd otherwise be spending on home care. <clears throat> I think in the individual um, programmes, underneath them, um, there'll be various abilities to report on those, but I think as Rachel's saying, this is very much <clears throat> something that's in development. But I think the original business case um, probably also predicated some benefits that, that were gonna be uh, delivered as well. I think the point about the, biz, uh, the case study examples is, is key and the Health Watch reports as well, because what we often lack in some of this data is, we can, is, is we've got the numbers, but it's actually what are the outcomes we're delivering for our residents. And certainly the, uh, the Health Watch reports, um, when they've looked at JET, um, when they've looked at some of the home first approaches, have checked in with people who've received services um, and got that qualitative feedback as well. Okay, thank you. I think it would be very interesting perhaps for a future scrutiny to look at that kind of data when we have the fuller picture because I appreciate you're probably at the beginning, even though we're four years into really seeing those outcomes. Um, my second question was around the development of the initiatives and the sort of reliance on third sector organisations um, providing that care or providing that additional capacity. Um, you know, I, my, I, when I sort of see that, I naturally, naturally think like the third sector is a great tool but shouldn't be a master and relied upon in case, you know, charities have up, ups and downs in, um, in fundraising, in their ability to staff, etc. They might not be there in the, in, in the future. Age UK is a huge charity that might be more stable than some. But uh, is that a concern that some of these programs do rely on third sector rather than NHS provision? No. <laughs> um, so I think um, if, if you take the hospice as an example, we're providing NHS care. We're commissioned to do that. Um, nobody else is doing it in Greenwich. We're the only provider. Um, so we are an NHS provider. We just happen to not be an NHS organisation. 
Um, and in terms of the kind of governance model that supports our sustainability and gives you and the residents of Greenwich the assurance that we're going to be here next week, um, I like to think that that's as robust as it can be. Um, we're one of only two or three hospices in the country who are actually uh, regulated by NHSE and improvement through their independent provider uh, uh, mechanisms. Um, and so we're pro providing the same kind of level of financial uh, information to them that a foundation trust would be doing, um, obviously at a smaller level, but nonetheless that's happening. Um, I think what the voluntary sector brings to these conversations is a bit more independence so that we can provide challenge, um, but also expertise in particular areas that, quite frankly, other providers don't necessarily have. Um, so, um, and interestingly, not in Greenwich, but in Bexley, we're part of a consortium of eight uh, charities who are now providing about 30% of adult social care assessments and reviews on behalf of London Borough of Bexley um, to residents who historically might have been reluctant to access statutory support because of the stigma attached to getting support from the council. Um, and they're now getting um, support with trusted organisations that they already have a relationship with, um, where they're not having to tell their story again. So I think there's real value actually in using the diverse voluntary sector that exists in Greenwich to uh, provide more of that probably. Just to add to that, when, um, um, as we've said, Health Watch are a, a big part of, of what we're doing and how we work, and we're always, we always have a healthy challenge from Health Watch to, to consider all of the third sector. Um, we have been linking a lot more with GHive recently and going in and kind of seeing what opportunities there are because there's a huge amount delivered in the community by um, the third sector. Um, in, the, in the paper, I think we talk about Age UK and Child and Athletic. They're, they're, supporting us with um, social prescribing. So this is all around, you know, making sure that people are, are living their best life really and connected to all the different things that they, they want in, in their life. And it's not the expertise that we have, as Kate says, in, in our NHS organisations. They, they're the experts, which, which is why we, we, we have them as part of the teams. Thank you. Um, I think a question I wanted to ask is around the night sitting service which we see probably the pilot you decided afterwards not to take forward. I just wanted to know more about what the pilot found out and how we came to that decision that it was not needed. Yeah, the pilot was, <clears throat> excuse me, the pilot was um, delivering a programme through a, a private healthcare company called Homelink were brought in for a nine month period. They were providing uh, bridging packages. So this is a service where people leave hospital and get some support, um, a bit like home care, um, on discharge. Um, and that's, how, that's what we piloted. So it wasn't technically night sitting. We do have some night sitting um, already in the borough through Marie Curie provide that. Um, so that wasn't a gap. This was a, a project that we'd, we'd piloted, but we actually realized through the pilot that the service was provided anyway through our kind of social care offer. Um, and it was, it, you know, we were fragmenting services a little by having a, a different um, provider. So we, we've reviewed that um, scheme. What's happened to that funding is that we've been able to re repurpose it and think about reinvesting it this year. So um, it's not that it's not there anymore. It's funding that we can use for other schemes. And do you have an idea of where that's feeding into currently? We've literally just been talking about it today. So um, we have some areas, um, I'm trying to remember now. So we'd, all three of us, all three organisations, RBG uh, for a seven day working in the JET team, um, end of life services for Kate's team. So uh, um, working, pulling people from hospital out to the hospice um, and our, our community team. So some of our um, district nursing pressures. 
Okay, I think one final question from me, um, which obviously is not my area of expertise, so I don't know if this is, is particularly relevant, but my concern just from reading the report is one of the things that wasn't mentioned in there is um, how you prioritise pain management for people when they're not being regularly seen not as they would be on a ward and you know if pain suddenly increases or they um, how that's being noted and prioritized as a concern um, so that was one you know how do we ensure that the kind of level of pain and comfort management and um, in the home is the same as it would be in a hospital um, but also on the other side of that the safeguarding of pain management in an area where there may be very strong medications, you have family members, um, strangers coming in and out of the house, and the, just the safety of that. So, uh, largely speaking, we'd be talking about a palliative care population, I think, with this. And a, a palliative care a person with palliative care needs who's being looked after at home will be probably receiving support from the hospice and from district nursing. Um, in terms of how we manage pain relief, if somebody has um, uncontrolled pain, then that might be a good reason to bring somebody into the hospice to give uh, more uh, intensive opportunity to do the assessment to titrate their medication to an appropriate level and to get them into a situation where their pain is controlled so that would be one option but also we we have quite a lot of different tools in our chest if you like in terms of how we manage pain um, and particularly different preparations that we can use so um, when we're prescribing pain relief to somebody, we would usually prescribe something that they're having all of the time that's working throughout the 24-hour period that might be a slow-release medication, and that might be delivered orally, or it might be delivered via a pump that is uh, refilled once a day, or it might be provided via a transdermal patch, a bit like a nicotine patch. So those kind of background, if you like, pain relief, once once the level is, is titrated to the right level, that should be pretty stable and people shouldn't need much support with that. We obviously have the options of people going in to help people with their medication if need be, and we use dosset boxes and the like from pharmacies. We then also prescribe as required medication for people to take on top and we would make sure that the person is competent to understand what they should be doing and how much they should be taking and um, make sure they've got a preparation that they can manage. But on the safety element that you're describing, there are also mechanisms that we can use to manage that. So we can have locked boxes in the house, for example, that mean that you know people are not going to be um, snaffling away people's medicines if if they shouldn't be doing and and I think you know that kind of risk assessment is part of what our uh, staff both in district nursing and in in the hospice are trained to do is to think about okay who else is in this house who's coming and going what are the risks and how are we going to manage it appropriately and we would um, you know if we were concerned we wouldn't put the public or the patient at risk. So we would obviously use normal mechanisms to manage that. So I think my, the question is the scaling up of patients coming out of hospital um, into that home setting. That's not been problematic from that point of view at all. You've had the capacity to be able to manage that and it's not been a concern that's come across in the scaling up of the operation of people being in those settings. I mean, people across all the services will have issues with pain management, and the JET team probably um, would see someone in an acute phase. So if somebody is unwell, the two-hour response is, is cited in the, the paper. Um, if someone is very unwell and they need a visit, then the team would go out within two hours to see them, and that could include pain management. They have access to the pharmacist, and we have been able to fund a GP in that team. So... It, we, we can prescribe medication if needed at that point. So we can do things quickly if needed. Um, so, and we do have capacity in that team. That team has grown hugely through the programme, through Home First. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you very much. Is there any other questions from members? Okay, well, thank you, Rachel, uh, Kate, uh, Nick. Um, we'll close that item. Can thank I also you. say thank you, and thank you for all your time coming here tonight and answering all those questions. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Okay, so um, we'll move on to item six, which is the time to talk services, um, which I think, uh, Ian, you're leading on. Um, are the rest of you participating in this, or do you want to leave? All right, we'll give you a moment, Kate, to head off. Uh, great, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to give you an update on Greenwich Time to Talk. So, my name's Ian Diamond, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Oxleys. Um, so, hopefully, colleagues have had a chance to read uh, the papers that were included in the pack. I was just going to draw out um, some of the kind of key issues um, and just make a few additional comments, uh, and then obviously, uh, very happy to take questions. Um, just so to recap, Greenwich Time to Talk um, is an NHS talking therapy service uh, aimed at people experiencing anxiety and depression. Um, it's based in Eltham. Uh, in terms of how talking therapies are measured nationally, um, there are two um, criteria um, which are looked at. One is around access and the second is around recovery rates. But in addition to that, we also measure weights uh, from referral to treatment. So in the last uh, financial year, you will have seen that uh, in terms of our access target, we've increased the number of referrals by 26% uh, compared to the previous financial year, uh, and that equates to around 2,000 additional uh, referrals. And <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and that's a huge amount of work uh, to uh, increase the number of referrals. And I've included in the papers um, some additional detail um, around the fact that we've uh, seen, been able to see a small increase in the number of people um, being referred or referring themselves um, from black and minority ethnic um, communities. Um, and we've also um, undertaken quite a few different initiatives uh, to try and target um, people with anxiety and depression, but also with coexisting uh, health conditions. So uh, a lot of focus on people who've got long-term physical health conditions and also people with coexisting uh, uh, drug and alcohol issues as well. Um, so the result of um, increasing the number of referrals has been uh, a corresponding increase in the number of patients entering treatment compared to the previous year, uh, and that, that's uh, an additional 1,000 people uh, entering into uh, treatment. Um, so moving away from access, if I just say something a bit about something about recovery rates. Um, so one of the ways in which we've uh, managed to increase um, uh, access um, has been through a broadening of the criteria um, for acceptance of um, patients into the service. Um, and what that can mean at times is that we're seeing people with um, increasingly complex uh, presentations. Um, and that has uh, an impact um, in terms of waiting times as um, with increasingly complex presentations, there's an increased likelihood uh, that more people will require uh, what we call step three treatment, which is the highest uh, level of treatment. Um, and secondly, it can have an impact, uh, a negative impact on recovery rates. Uh, and you'll have seen from the pack that our recovery rates have uh, reduced slightly. Um, although we re remain above um, the uh, national target. Um, I remember from previous appearance uh, here that we had quite a discussion around the, the concept of recovery. 
Um, so in terms of talking therapies, recovery is measured in terms of something called caseness. Uh, and that, what that means is that patients are considered to have recovered if um, the score that they had for either um, anxiety and or depression um, at the beginning of treatment, um, which would have been above the clinical threshold, is below the cl clinical threshold at the end of treatment. Um, and NHS Talking Therapies operates a policy of only uh, claiming demonstrated recovery. So if we have patients who are missing, uh, we, who have got data post-treatment missing, they are coded as not having recovered. Um, but what I would say is that, of course, many people who receive treatment in pr improve significantly, even if they do not fully recover. So we do track that uh, alongside recovery, uh, and that's something called reliable improvement. Um, and reliable improvement involves uh, a reduction um, of the scores that people have for anxiety and or depression, um, which have reduced by a reliable amount. And at the same time, there hasn't been a, um, a, a, an increase um, uh, in the, the people's symptoms. Uh, and then the, the last area I was just going to highlight um, is around waiting time from uh, referral to treatment. Um, so currently, our, um, in terms of assessment, most people are, are seen within two to three weeks. Uh, and then for the different treatment pathways, um, the average waiting times are as follows. So for uh, what we call step two, which is guided self-help, which is a combination of... Um, Patients under doing work themselves with guidance uh, from a therapist um, intermittently, um, the average waiting time from a uh, referral to treatment is 18 days. Um, for counselling, it is 51 days, and for CBT, uh, it is 54 days. Um, and that's all I was going to highlight. Councillor Merrill. Um, thank you. Thank you. For, thank you for that. Can I just be clear on that last point? If someone is referred to you by a GP, they only wait 51 days, which is about six weeks, before they get to see a counsellor, before they get treatment for the, with a, with a counsellor? Yeah, before they start treatment. Is that a waiting time that's rapidly improved over the last few years? Because that wasn't the case when a member of my family needed it. It was months. The wait was months. So the, the, the six-week wait has been um, it's average that for the last couple of years. Um, so that, that has been improvement. I, I can't remember where we were before that. Um, mm -hmm. But there was an improvement some years ago, and we've, we've managed to maintain it. Um. Okay, can I just add on to that? As you say, the last few years, is that including um, during the pandemic when there might have been a different level of demand? So during, during the pandemic, so pre-pandemic, most contacts, clinical contacts were face-to-face -face, um, with a small number that were done either by uh, video or telephone. Um, with the pandemic, we maintained the same activity levels by varying the, the kind of modality of treatment. So we increased the number of um, kind of virtual appointments. And that it did mean that we kept track uh, with the increase in referrals that you're right, we did see during the pandemic. Um, and you'll see from the pack that the numbers of um, referrals have continued to go up. Councillor Hartley. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation, very helpful. Um, can I just check my understanding about this recovery rate point? So the recovery rate over a kind of crude metric overall has fallen, but that's because uh, with, you, you are deliberately making sure that people with more complex needs are accessing the service. Is that is that fair? 
Yeah, so um, what, what you see um, across all um, talking therapy services, there, there, there is a kind of link between recovery and access. And often what happens if one goes up, then the other goes down. Um, and obviously we're, we're trying to kind of um, try and reach somewhere in the middle. But um, if you um, increase the number of complex presentations, the, there's less likelihood of recovery just simply because of the, the, um, the complex nature of, of the, um, the presentation. Um, and that might be linked to kind of how long they've experienced it, et cetera. That makes sense. Thank you. So is there a, do you have data that controls for those access effects? So I suppose what I'm trying to get at is, um, you know, what, how do you assure yourself that the recovery rate for the same cohort of um, service users is not declining? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, within the team, um, within our electronic record system, so there's a specific electronic record system for um, Greenwich Time to Talk, which enables us to kind of break down the clinical coding, and we can break down patient populations so that we can um, kind of measure like, like with like. Yeah. Thanks, I wasn't asking for the data, I just, just wanted the comfort that it's yeah. that, 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 that is looked at, thank you. And then the, um, the final question is just about channel. Um, so 20% face-to-face, 52% telephone, and 27% video. Um, are we, what trend are we seeing in, in uh, preference of service users? Is there a trend towards, uh, you know, away from face-to-face -face services? And I think particularly of Eltham High Street, uh, you know, I've always wondered actually the location of that how sensible is that in terms of the stigma that shouldn't be there but we know is um in terms of people may not want to you know walk off the high street into a time to talk service um so perhaps you could comment on both those things yeah sure so if, so if i take the second point um i mean like many talking therapies services the the decision to locate it on a high street was deliberate and it was actually so it's an interesting perspective that it might um, create stigma. I think the idea is that by putting it in an anonymous building on a high street, not on a hospital site, um, that helps people access. But um, I think it can be argued either way. Just to say that we are currently reviewing the lease on that building anyway, uh, and we're looking uh, at whether we um, move it around the corner to Passy Place, um, which is behind Eltham Hospital. Um, I guess the advantage of that is that there's a number of different kinds of health services on that, in that kind of cul-de-sac, so you, you wouldn't necessarily know, people wouldn't necessarily know what you're going for. Um, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten the first question. No, that's really helpful, yeah, and I wasn't taking a view either way. It's just, that, as you say, there's different ways you can, you can kind of look at it and look at the problem. Um, the first part of the question was, um, around channel, is there a shift in, in service user preference for cha on channel? Yeah, I think, I mean, we, um, we do routinely survey um, people that um, have used the service um, starting in, in COVID. Um, and there is definitely a move um, to receiving treatment, uh, either on telephone or, or video. Um, often people are working, um, so it kind of it's helpful from that point of view, um, and and in addition through um, Greenwich Time to Talk itself, and at times where we've used subsidiary providers, they can provide appointments outside um, kind of normal nine to five. So uh, again, people often prefer that kind of virtual contact. But it, I think um, as a trust overall, and particularly in mental health services and different other other kinds of mental health services is something that we, we keep under active review um, and we're, we're trying to make sure that um, treatment preferences are driven by patients rather than um, kind of staff preference. So, yeah. can, I, can I just mention something there as well? So um, in terms of our the long-term conditions uh, service, uh, we do make lots of referrals from our COPD team, our cardiac team, district nursing, all the physical health services as well. Um, and I think the benefit of having um, telephone or video 
um, options is, is preferable because people are sometimes housebound in those populations. So we, uh, we work closely with the long-term conditions um, lead in the Greenwich Time to Talk service and, and have really benefited from having that in place. It's been about three years or so, so that's been really positive for us. Uh, just sorry, just to add, in, in terms of the um, the kind of CBT pathway, some of that is, is individual work and some of it is group work. Um, and often patient experiences that the group work virtually um, is, a, is a kind of better experience for, for people. Um, yeah. Councillor Bakken. Um, thank you for the report. Um, I just had two questions. Um, my first one is, it's really impressive that you've managed to have over, by broadening your criteria, that you've had over 2,000 referrals with no real discernible impact on your waiting list. Um, I just wondering, has there been like a big investment in terms of like increased staffing or anything? Cause, but if not, that's that's really good and positive. I think we should um, definitely note that as a panel. Um, and then my only other question is um, just the 733 referrals on page Ten of the report that have been passed to Xyla Digital, and I was just wondering who they were and, and what they do. Yeah, sure. So, um, in terms of additional funding, there hasn't been additional funding, so it's really been uh, a kind of productivity gain. Um, and again, I think some of that productivity gain has come from um, putting some of the treatments online. Um, so that's increased the numbers um, and in terms of the the different kind of steps of treatment quite a large number of those people will be at the kind of lower steps so um, there's the greater capacity uh, there but yeah I think it's it's still it's still a, a high number of um, um, patients to be seeing so um, uh, yeah I think um, the team are to be c congratulated um, so, Xyla, we used to use a, an organization called Dr. Julian. Um, we're now using Xyla. Um, they're a kind of private provider of talking therapies. Um, we use them. So, one of the things it says in the report is that um, talk, the, the service itself at times experiences quite high turnover. Um, usually, that's at the kind of lower, um, lower banded posts. Uh, again, associated with um, step one and step two, and um, and it's often for good a good reason. So people go on to train, um, and some of those people come back, which is is a good thing. Um, so, in the times when um, we uh, have vacancies, we basically use the money, the underspend from those vacancies, uh, to um, pass it to Xyla, who are, I say, private provider. Um, so that we continue to be able to um, uh, keep the number of contacts up. So it's quite targeted. Um, and also, um, as I think it says in the paper, we're quite careful about the, the types of cases we pass to them. So they're generally uh, the less complex uh, cases. Um, and we have you know, pretty robust uh, governance processes in terms of monitoring uh, the outcomes that they're getting. Um, and that they get similar level, uh, similarly good uh, outcomes to our Oxley's service. So, yeah. uh, Councillor Merrill. Yeah, I'm sorry, Chair. I'm going to have to leave. I'm afraid. Apologies for leaving early. Noted. Um, just a couple of questions from me. Um, you mentioned the tracking improvement towards recovery. I'm talking about reliable improvement. I wondered how long term that tracking is. Um, you know, how can we say for some people mental health might be an episodic or a chronic uh, experience? So I wondered had we had the longer term data on the effect of, of uh, the talking therapy? Um, it's a really good question. And, and you're right, particularly I think in terms of when we talk about reliable improvement, because um, things like anxiety and low mood aren't necessarily things that can be cured. They're, it's about how we help people to um, kind of manage um, their lives and uh, their kind of reaction to kind of life events. Um, I'm not aware that we've done long-term 
studies, but I'd have to go back. I could go back to the team and certainly find out because I think it's a it's a really good question. I think what we would um, measure is kind of re-referral rate. So um, that would be, I guess, a proxy measure for um, um, the kind of long-term effects of treatment. Um, so I could certainly um, source that information and, and pass it to, to Raymond for the for the. Um, panel to have a look at, yeah. Thank you, I think that would be very interesting. Um, my next question is about uh, inequalities. You talk particularly about um, improving by 5% comparatively referrals from the black um, and ethnic minority communities. I was wondering how had you achieved that particular uh, increase and is there um, a particular methodology that you're using to reach other groups which might be difficult to generally get into that your normal referral pathways yeah um, so there are there are kind of um, a number of different dimensions to this um, the first starts with the um, the kind of diversity of the workforce itself so um, back in 2020 I think like a lot of um, NHS organizations um, in uh, kind of response, I guess, to um, societal, um, what was happening more widely in society, we started talking to um, our staff, and particularly staff uh, who were non-white, about their experience of working uh, to Oxleys, uh, with Oxleys. That led to uh, a kind of one of our strategic uh, aims, which is called building a fair Oxleys, but it's really to kind of reduce um, the, the kind of differences that people who, who, from a non-white background were experiencing in terms of being an employee of Oxleys. Um, and this particular team, um, we, we encourage teams uh, through a kind of program of, um, I guess, self-examination and, and discussion to look at what, what diversity means for them. Um, this team really uh, took that on board um, and went through quite um, the really interesting case study of how they kind of thought about diversity in the context of context of their own team. Um, and that broadened out not just around kind of race and ethnicity, but other kind of protected characteristics as well. But what it's meant is that the team over time has been, uh, is a much more diverse um, uh, group of staff much more reflective of the, the kind of diverse community in Greenwich. Um, and people have generated particular interests uh, in working with different parts of the community. So Rachel talked about long-term conditions. We've got a kind of long-term condition uh, um, kind of um, work stream, similarly around um, uh, alcohol and substance misuse. But we also had then had a kind of particular focus um, on the access of the non of non uh, BAME communities into psychological therapies, um, so it's a very small increase that we've seen. Um, we've also uh, enabled uh, therapies to be uh, delivered through interpreters. We've looked at things like um, um, you know providing therapy in a range of languages. So. Um, not just interpreters, but um, 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 employing staff who speak different languages. So I think it's a combination of things. Um, it's a very early stage. Um, Oxley's, because it is a mental health provider, um, is um, has adopted something called the pa Patient Carer Race Equality Framework. Um, and one of the explicit aims of that is to increase uh, the access uh, of BAME communities into psychological therapies um, because it's it's been well known nationally that it's much lower than it, it should be. So um, I think we're, we're at the beginning of a, a much longer journey. 5% increase, it's not huge, but it's going in the right direction. But um, I think we'd acknowledge it's not um, necessarily reflective of the diversity of the whole population. Okay, I think one final question from me, and thank you for the answer, it's very comprehensive, um, was around uh, 
you say, a certain number of um, Time for Talk practitioners are now operating adjoined to or in the same premises as GP practices. Is, I just wanted to know what kind of proportion that was, and also is this the kind of direction you wish to go down in moving more into those same locations, so perhaps building on Hartley's point earlier? Um, so we, we've always had a presence in um, uh, GP practices in Greenwich ever since the, the service started. Um, it, I think it's been hard to kind of get a strategic spread um, because it's very much based on practices one willingness to partner with us, uh, the affordability, uh, the availability of space, and then the affordability of the kind of leasing uh, arrangements. Um, and then with COVID, of course, when so much went online, um, we, we actually decreased um, our presence in general practice. So I think we are looking to um, increase it again. Um, it is the general direction of travel. Um, a bit, I mean, a bit of like home first, this is very much, we see it as a kind of partnership approach. Um, GPs are, apart from self-referrals, GPs are our main source of referral. So, um, and I think if patients are comfortable in coming to a GP practice, uh, then we're very happy to kind of provide the service there, yeah. Okay, thank you. Do any other questions from members? In which case, um, Ian, thank you very much. That was a lovely report, um, very comprehensive, and uh, it's actually very um, pleasing to know there's been so much progress. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, um, we don't actually have any other items on the agenda. Um, just to note that we did do a consultation on items for the next work plan, which I've passed on to Domlo Bang who will be taking over the chair of this panel uh, from May onwards, when our next meetings are. Um, I've not had any notified AOB, so I will close the meeting. Thank you very much.